It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the second day of our conference. Today we have a series of plenary sessions. Uh, so to use the language of summer festivals, this is the big stage. Our theme this morning is theory in private international law. I have to say this is rather a challenging topic uh, if you are a, an English lawyer. Uh, as many of you will know, Geoffrey Cheshire famously wrote uh, in the um, first edition of his famous book that there is no theory in English private international law. Uh, some may regard this as, as, as being a bold statement of English pragmatism, but of course it's a very strange statement because to say there is no theory is itself to stake out a theoretical position. I suspect, however, that our great Cambridge colleague John Collier would agree uh, with Cheshire's assessment. Um, I inherited from John his copy of Walter Wheeler Cook's Logical and Legal Bases of a Conflict of Laws, inherited and annotated, annotated by John in his own inimitable way. There is a passage uh, in which Cook is extolling the virtues of an instrumentalist realist approach to uh, the choice of law process, John's comment is, in the margin, not in this country, it isn't. <laughs> Very well, uh, those caveats notwithstanding, we have a distinguished team to present this morning. Uh, we have Horatio Neal Watt, we have Alex Mills, and we have Juice Blom. I'm not going to say anything more about them because they need no introduction, which is always very fortunate if you're in the position um, of being a chair. Uh, nor will I attempt to summarize what they're going to say because that, after all, is their job. Each of them has 20 minutes to speak, which will be rigidly enforced, and then there will be the opportunity for discussion. So can I welcome first Horatio Newell. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for the introduction, and thank you to the whole team uh, for this absolutely wonderful uh, welcome, and I must say it's a great privilege and honor to uh, be uh, participating in this panel on legal theory, which is indeed uh, quite a challenge. Um, my paper, which is actually, uh, I think, on the... Uh, conference website is, is a long paper. Uh, it's quite a challenge to sum it up uh, in uh, 20 minutes. Um, basically, uh, what I want to do is make a case for a legal pluralist revival uh, within the conflict of laws. Um, now, last night at the uh, very, very nice uh, dinner, Richard made a reference to the dismal swamp metaphor. Um, we're all in dismal swamp. We exchange rather um, obscure ideas in abstruse language. Um, and to a certain extent, um, Richard betrayed a certain amusement, if not a sort of gloating attitude to this dismal swamp. And I think uh, we have all, for quite a long time, been fairly proud of being in a dismal swamp. But um, to come back to uh, why I'm making up this case for a legal pluralist revival, um, Neil Walker, in a book that came out this year called Intimations of Global Law, which you may have um, come across, does actually talk about private international law quite a lot. This might, may come as a surprise to some of you. Um, it's a, a, a legal theorist talking about the state of the law uh, and the what he calls these intimations of global law. And he says, not that the conflict of laws is a dismal swamp, but that private international in, law in general uh, has uh, is taken up uh, mainly by parochial boundary maintenance. Now, that is actually not very flattering, um, and perhaps there's less to gloat, gloat about than being in a dismal swamp. Um, and so I thought that this was a challenge that needed to be taken up. And uh, so what I want to do now 
is not summarize my whole, whole paper, uh, which would be actually quite difficult. It's, um, the paper is meant to be a, a launching paper for a new, um, for the New Year's uh, research program uh, that I'm doing in, in Paris. It's actually been funded, but by social scientists. So I don't know quite what that implies. I mean, we can yeah. think about that. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a sort of a, 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 an attempt in progress um, to, to renew uh, some theoretical thinking within uh, the conflict of laws. So what, I'll, what I'd like to do is just um, point out the need, why I see this to be important. Um, then um, I would like to go through some of the points where I think there might be mutual benefit in connecting up uh, the conflict of laws to various contemporary strands in uh, legal pluralism. And then I'd like to talk about one or two examples, because this is probably um, the, the, the point that's lacking and one of the problems with uh, legal theory, particularly in the sort of intimated field of, uh, of global law, you know, what are you actually talking about? Uh, I'll try and respond to that by uh, one or two uh, illustrations according to the time that I've, I've got. Um, so why do we need a revival, as we're actually quite happy in our dismal swamp? Um, well, it seems to me, and, and, and obviously I'm not saying that they're not extremely interesting things going on. I mean, I, I, I feel absolutely part of the swamp. Um, I feel that there's some extraordinarily interesting topics going on. This conference is, uh, obviously provides excellent illustration of that. Um, there are extremely stimulating uh, technical, legal technical issues. Uh, I was sitting in the arbitration panel yesterday, for instance, the interface between uh, Brussels, the Brussels regulation and arbitration. It's obviously a wonderful uh, topic. It has jurisprudential dimensions to it, of course, if it, you know, when you think about what arbitration actually is um, and the competition that it's providing to uh, more traditional um, court-based uh, procedures. Um, and there are many other uh, wonderful topics around. I'm not saying that these aren't interesting. What I'm saying is that when you look over the wall, let's say, and uh, you look at debates that are going on at the moment in legal theory or the social sciences, um, you can see that um, there are an enormous amount of um, ideas that are being uh, mooted about uh, what law is becoming in a global age or perhaps a, sort of a late modern age. And although it seems to me that conflicts of norms anyway are at the center of all this, there is never any mention of private international law or the conflict of laws as such. Um, so you go and listen to um, social legal studies people talking about um, conflicting norms, conflicting social norms, uh, you go and listen to debates about the new foundations of transnational authority. You go to human rights debates about um, the extraterritorial reach of various fundamental rights. You see conflict of laws everywhere, but there are never any private international lawyers. Now, I don't think that's because private international lawyers are not interested in these topics, on the contrary. But uh, I think there's a perception on the outside of our swamp that what we're doing is not relevant. And so, to a certain extent, it is that point that I'm, I, I'm trying to, to address, uh, perhaps uh, uh, repair. Um, and I think there are many points on which there are now global constitutionalists, there are now socio-legal uh, scholars, uh, there are now systems theorists, 
Uh, there are now public international lawyers. There are all sorts of people uh, doing things that are actually uh, very, very familiar uh, to our uh, usual swampy uh, type of preoccupations. So that's for the need. And um, I, I put quite a lot of uh, citations and references in my paper. But uh, as I was uh, saying at the outset, I think that if you take Neil Walker's book on the intimations of global law and see where he has put conflict, the conflict of laws on a kind of a, well, he's done a kind of a panorama, a panoramic survey of all sorts of legal theories that have to do with law beyond the state. And the conflict of laws is classified in um, collateral coordinative mechanisms, along with uh, legal pluralism and, and others. Um, but although he does discuss a certain number of ideas, uh, we're clearly not all that relevant. Okay, so my second point is, uh, where would the uh, mutual benefit be? In other words, if we do have uh, an intellectual exchange with um, people who are working on legal theory outside uh, the conflict of laws, and particularly with uh, legal pluralists, uh, what, could be, what could be gained by that? Well, I think this is a very two-sided affair. It's, I'm not talking about a one-way street, and I'm not saying that everything wonderful is going on outside the swamp, but I'm not saying that everything wonderful is going on inside the swamp either. I think there is um, uh, a mutual benefit to be gained. Um, and on the one hand, I think that global legal pluralism, and I'm putting that in uh, inverted commas, um, it covers a whole series of strands of thinking, it's a little bit long to go into that, but people who are thinking about what law is becoming beyond the state. I think that global legal pluralism would have a lot to gain by uh, being more curious about what's happening and what has happened uh, for a long time uh, within the conflict of laws. Um, why? because I think one of the first uh, discoveries of global legal pluralism in all its strands is uh, the fact that conflicts are everywhere. In other words, what the global theorists are discovering, there's an interesting piece by Paul Berman on this. Um, he wrote a book about um, uh, for a, uh, a jurisprudence across borders. And uh, his discovery is that there are conflicts of law norms everywhere. In other words, what, what characterizes the global or the post-national? Well, actually, conflicts. Um, and I think this is a very interesting point. Um, it's a discovery that's quite obvious for us, obviously, when we think about uh, what goes on beyond the states that actually there are conflicts of norms all the time. Um, they may not look, or they may not be formulated in the way in which we define what a conflict of laws is and where sort of the, the threshold of private international law starts. What do you need to start using conflict of law rules? Or when do you start asking questions about jurisdiction? What is a domestic case and what is an international case? Um, so the, the formulation is different. Uh, nevertheless, legal theorists or global legal theorists are starting to see these complex conflicts of norms everywhere. They might be diagonal instead of horizontal. Uh, they might be multi-level or multi-layered. There are all sorts of vocabularies that are different. Uh, nevertheless, there are conflicts everywhere. Um, and I think that's on the first point about how you define a conflict uh, and um, what it looks like, what you do with it, that legal theory could uh, actually have a lot to gain by looking uh, at uh, the conflict of laws. Uh, the second point on which um, global legal pluralists might have a lot to gain by looking at uh, the conflict of 
course, is obviously um, in looking for, in trying to find uh, solutions to these conflicts. Once you realize that there are conflicts everywhere, uh, the next step is to uh, try and deal with them. Uh, and here again, there are a lot of uh, interesting ideas. Um, one of them is uh, Gunter Teubner's idea about using the idea of sustainability, taking it out of environmental uh, studies or ecology and using it to characterize the relationship between a norm and its environment. So the, the, the idea of environment is actually uh, slid from being nature and what is outside of us to being the normative environment within uh, the conflict of laws. And uh, he uses the idea of sustainability that comes from uh, environmental studies to say, well, uh, what we really need is a conflict of law solution that, is, that responds to a certain number of criteria of sustainability. In other words, a, a kind of a balanced relationship between a norm and its environment. And what I see there are ideas uh, that um, when um, a given norm produces effect outside its own constituency, uh, many of these effects are negative. Many of these effects are externalities. And his sustainability idea is about controlling those externalities. Now, those ideas have been used in the conflict of laws, but they're much more familiar to other vocabularies. The economists have been thinking about this, uh, other social scientists more, more generally. Um, but to a certain extent, many of our conflict of law solutions are doing just that. They are regulating the uh, relationship between norms and their environment, even if we're talking only about legal norms, and even if we have a fairly narrow understanding of what the environment within the receiving system uh, of a norm actually is. But that's, to a certain extent, what we might be able to bring to global legal pluralism, and to a certain extent, that's their problem. If we take the question on the other way around, what can legal pluralism bring to the conflict of laws? Well, there again, um, I think there are several points on which we could gain from reading uh, quite a lot of the contemporary literature. I think that um, uh, the legal pluralists such as George, oh, sorry, Paul, Paul Berman, uh, got it, um, and Gunter Teibner, Neil Walker, um, all these are people who could be read with profit. Um, first of all, because I think they've got a very exciting idea of what conflicts actually are. Uh, in other words, uh, they talk about intermingling um, unstable, dynamic conflicts. Now, there again, one has to work through this vocabulary. Um, it may seem to us fairly swampish. I mean, after all, it's their disciplinary swamp. Uh, but it's exciting. It's bringing complexity into what uh, conflicts actually are, and I think that it uh, deserves to be taken seriously. Um, other points on which I think uh, we would gain by uh, taking a look outside our, our, our swamp um, is on the actual problematic uh, of uh, conflicts and what we can do about them. In other words, um, the question of non-state norms uh, and legitimacy, which Alex Mills is going to be talking about later, that is obviously a central preoccupation uh, for global legal theory, uh, what do you do when you've got rating agencies, um, forest stewardry agencies, um, multinationals, uh, and many others all making something that looks law-like, at least uh, from certain uh, perspectives, what do you do about this? Um, and we all know from old versions, pre-global versions of legal pluralism, 
But the problem always comes back to what do you do about the mafia? And uh, are mafia norms actually law? That's the standard question. Well, this question arises, of course, in contemporary uh, perspective with what do you do with credit ratings? Um, so legitimacy is central to these uh, debates about transnational uh, authority. I think it has to be taken very, very seriously. Um, and although this is actually the stalling point of many uh, versions of legal pluralism, they have been thinking about this. I mean, this is, a, this is the uh, standard uh, problem. And I think we would gain uh, from um, looking at the way that these, uh, this issue is actually dealt with. Uh, one way that I've suggested in my paper uh, to deal with the legitimacy conundrum um, is that we shouldn't be looking for an absolute. In other words, in this unstable, dynamic, evolutive climate, perhaps a given norm, a credit rating, uh, a code of uh, multinational code of conduct or whatever, might be legitimate in one context and not in another. In other words, usable in one and not in the other. So, I will, uh, as I can see that perhaps I'm overloading my time, I'll just uh, mention two examples to finish. They're all in the paper, too. Um, they're very different. One is, the, is a human rights case. It's the full veil case. Um, it may not mean so much here as it does, uh, for instance, in France, uh, because the case originated, the, the case that went up to the European Court of Court of Human Rights originated in France. Uh, but it's, a, it's an example that's used by Paul Berman in his uh, cross-border jurisprudence uh, piece. And um, it's, it's a, an example that he uses to show that if we used conflict of laws thinking, we might be able to uh, shed better light on the complexities of issues that come up in a given case, and um, a case that nobody manages to solve satisfactorily. I think that's the, the criteria. You know, We have a lot of difficult issues, difficult legal issues. Um, our traditional tools are OK, but often they, they make a mess of solving these questions. Isn't there a new way of going about, about uh, solving them? So uh, the Full Veil case, uh, which is about a, a woman who um, was wearing a uh, full veil in France and came up against the French prohibition of full veils in public places, um, can be analyzed, whatever, whatever the solution, and obviously there are, there, there are a lot of ways that one can uh, deal with this uh, problem. But as a, as a conflict of laws problem, uh, well, it wasn't one, right? This woman was not saying, my personal status says I can wear a full veil. The um, question was viewed in terms of freedom of expression, individual, uh, individual freedom or rather identity, um, religious conflict, questions of public policy, and the interesting thing is that if you start thinking about this as a conflict of laws problem, in other words, a conflict of norms problem, uh, it brings up the complexity and perhaps, there I have to go quickly, uh, will help in a, some kind of a balancing effort uh, bring up uh, the most complex aspects of the case. The second uh, example that I use in my paper and I finished in one minute it's on page 36 of my paper. Uh, it's about uh, a very different case of um, Nestle chocolate using child slavery in its cocoa production farms in the Ivory Coast. So that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, in this case, which came up in the US in federal court, um, Nestle said, well, whatever goes on in those cocoa farms over there, has got nothing to do with me because actually there's a whole contractual chain in which I'm not involved. Right at the end of the chain, the farmers who produce the cocoa are in a contractual relationship with all the intermediaries, but however they grow their cocoa and whoever they use to 
uh, collect cocoa beans are their problem, not mine. And uh, the court uh, uses all sorts of very, very novel and interesting ways of saying, well, actually, no, you've got dominant market influence on the global chocolate market. And this leverage, you could have used it to prevent this. You did not. You actually lobbied uh, in Congress, as they met us, um, against um, slavery-free labeling of your, your chocolate products. Um, and therefore, therefore, the, you, cannot, you cannot say, A, that what's going on in cocoa farms is beyond your sphere of influence. You cannot hide behind contract to say that this is compartmented. And you cannot say, and this is the point of the crux, because it's an alien tort uh, statute case, you cannot say that it's beyond the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the United States. Now, this seems to be very interesting because it's using non-legal forms of normative influence uh, to arrive at something that traditional legal tools uh, couldn't, um, couldn't get to. So there we are. The rest is in the paper. And uh, thank you very much for your patience for listening to this swampy type of uh, development. Thank you. morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Richard and to uh, all the conference organizers for the opportunity to uh, make the journey back here to West Cambridge, uh, all the way from where I live in East Cambridge. The topic of my presentation today is the question of the legit legitimacy of a choice of non-state law. Should courts ever take non-state law as the applicable law? So it's about the perspective of state law on non-state law. To get to this question, however, I first need to say something about state law and legitimacy, then private international law, before I'll, before I'll arrive at non-state law. So let's begin with state law and the question of legitimacy. What is it that makes the law of a state legitimate? Why is state law binding? Now, of course, this is a question that legal philosophers have been debating for centuries, indeed millennia, and you'll be delighted to hear that I'll not be trying to answer this question. But to simplify things, there are essentially three main types of answers which legal theorists have come up with to account for legitimacy in the modern state. So law obtains its legitimacy in one of three main ways. The first of these we might call something like source legitimacy. Law obtains its legitimacy by being the command of a sovereign in Austin's formulation of this, or by being the command of popular sovereignty. That's through an idea, a, a model of direct democracy that we might associate with Aristotle or Rousseau, or representative de democracy that we might associate with Locke. The second main type of legitimacy argument that we see is something which, which uh, we might call procedural legitimacy. Law obtains its legitimacy by being the product of a decisional process which confers legitimacy on it. Uh, a model, something like participatory or deliberative democracy, um, which we can most closely associate uh, with Habermas uh, in the modern era. Or alternatively, law obtains its legitimacy by its collective acceptance after the fact as a set of binding norms, which is a model which we would probably most closely associate with HLA Hart. The third type of sort of criteria for legitimacy that we see in political theory is what we might call substantive legitimacy. So this is the idea that law is legitimate because it serves the interests of those who it governs, which is Raz's formulation of legitimacy, or that it reflects certain minimum requirements to be an acceptable normative system, uh, perhaps reflected in the adoption of constitutional rights, which is uh, Rawls's formulation of substantive legitimacy. So when we think about law within states, all these different ideas and variations of source legitimacy, procedural legitimacy, and substantive legitimacy are potentially at play. Each seems to capture part of a complex truth about when state law is legitimate. The next question I want to turn to is how private international law engages with these questions. 
Now, as you all know, when a legal relationship crosses borders, something remarkable happens. At least outside certain distinctive traditions in the United States, courts don't apply their law to every case, and their decision about which law to apply is based on an objective evaluation of the relationship to decide which legal system is most appropriate to regulate it. Now, of course, the question of appropriateness involves a very complex range of factors in modern private international law, traditional considerations of territorial and personal connections, the subjective wishes and expectations of the parties themselves, and different states take different views on how to weigh all these different factors, but the choice of law process essentially involves the same considerations in most states. Now, this process is not without values. For example, applying the most closely connected law reflects the value of horizontal subsidiarity, aiming to ensure that a legal issue is governed by the legal order constructed by those persons most closely affected by the issue. It also aspires to international values of decisional harmony, for example, reducing the risk of inconsistent judgments and debt incentives for forum shopping, and so forth. And sometimes choice of law rules also aim to promote certain substantive values, like protecting consumers or environmental protection, uh, as in the famous Article 7 of the Rome 2 Regulation in the EU. But the key thing I want to highlight is that the process is not based on a substantive evaluation of foreign laws or legal orders. The question is not which law is better, which is most democratic or most modern or leads to the most just outcome, but simply which is most appropriate to govern the legal issue. So behind all this, I think there's a higher level principle in place. In the choice of law process, the legal systems of states are presumed to be normatively equal. There is no greater weight given to the laws of democratic states or constitutional rule of law states. In the choice of law process, Germany, North Korea, and Turkmenistan are equal. As an echo in here of a fundamental principle of public international law, the sovereign equality of states, that all sovereigns are created equal. In choice of law, we similarly see the sovereign equality of state laws. In choice of law, once you are recognized as a sovereign, your legal system is entitled to the same consideration as every other legal system. So how might we frame this in legitimacy terms? It seems that in choice of law, we don't care much for process legitimacy. We don't care about how foreign law has been generated, whether through dictatorship or democracy, or whether the law has even been accepted by the people that it purports to govern. We care principally about source legitimacy, that the law comes from a recognized sovereign in the form of a state, which is still the basic and uh, most traditional criteria for legitimacy. Now it is, however, also true that choice of law methodology provides a means of guaranteeing a minimum standard of substantive legitimacy through the doctrine of public policy. Foreign law which violates minimum standards of justice does not need to be recognized. But apart from this limited consideration, choice of law rules presume that being the product of a recognized sovereign is sufficient and almost necessary to confer legitimacy on foreign law. This is an important qualification. I say almost necessary because there's one important and I think very interesting exception to this, which is known as the Namibia exception from the 1971 advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. It's given rise to a rule which is widely applied by national courts, which is that people who live in an unrecognized state but are subject to functionally effective rules of private law in that state, may and indeed should be governed by those rules. In this particular context, private international law, guided once again by public international law, looks beyond the source of the rules to their practical functioning, their general acceptance. Foreign law does not have to be the law of a recognized sovereign if it is the factual reality on the ground which actually governs people's lives. To quote Lord Wilberforce from the Carl Zeiss case in 1967, the courts may in the interest of justice and common sense, where no consideration of public policy to the contrary has to prevail, 
give recognition to the actual facts or realities found to exist. It's like a strange thing for a court to be doing in a private international law case. So what about non-state law? Why and when should a non-sovereign law be recognized through choice of law rules? Of course, the traditional view has been that non-sovereign law should not be directed directly recognized. That law means state law, not religious law or the uni principles of international commercial contracts. And as we all know, in the Rome 1 regulation, for example, only the law of a state can govern a contract, whether that law is determined by a choice of the parties or by the objective rules in the absence of choice. Perhaps this is a position that Neil Walker would describe as parochial boundary maintenance in his new book. Sure. Now, this is a view which has been challenged by the adoption in March this year of the Hague Principles on Choice of Law in International Commercial Contracts. And these principles provide in Article 2, Subsection 1, that a contract is governed by the law chosen by the parties, and in Article 3, that the law chosen by the parties may be rules of law that are generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level as a neutral and balanced set of rules unless the law of the forum provides otherwise. So I'll come back to this formulation uh, in a second. But I'd like to turn now to the question of how significant this development is for private international law, for non-state law, these questions of legitimacy. Well, the first point, I think, to make is that traditional state law has perhaps not been as hostile to non-state law as it's sometimes made out, uh, at least in some contexts. Although choice of law rules have traditionally required a choice of state law, there have been a range of techniques developed which permit a degree of openness to the indirect application or influence of non-state law. Uh, to give one example, the technique of incorporation, non-state law may be uh, indirectly given effect where a chosen national law has itself been derived from non-state law. Perhaps ironically, the Hague principles of choice of law in international commercial contracts are themselves a kind of transnational soft law which aspires to this kind of influence. They both permit choice of non-state law and are themselves a sort of non-state law. Uh, for another example of the influence of non-state law, we could mention the technique of contractual interpretation. It's long been accepted that parties can incorporate terms of non-state law as provisions of their contract. Uh, so we can see that in some areas, national law has been partially open to the influence of non-state law. But this has not involved the full recognition of non-state law as law because it's either subject to or mediated through the state. So should national law be open to the full recognition of non-state law as law? And if so, how should this take place? Now, it's been widely observed that in various areas of private relations, effectively autonomous regulatory systems have been established. Uh, even though they don't apply national law and have not been accepted by national law or national choice of law rules. In essence, state law these days is considered to be only one part of the broader universe of law. Perhaps the ecosystem of law is uh, the metaphor that we should be using. And sometimes we give this the, the rather grand name of global legal pluralism, which we heard about earlier this morning. The relative autonomy of these systems means that sometimes the influence of non-state law is a product of the absence or the ineffectiveness rather than the endorsement of state regulation. Sometimes non-state law happens in areas that state law uh, doesn't touch. These issues don't just arise in cross-border cases, of course, but also within states. The existence of non-state law means that choice of law issues arise not just between states, but also inside them. Now, there are three examples of these kinds of relatively autonomous non-state law systems in practice, which are most discussed. Uh, religious law, the application of Sharia law within Islamic communities, Jewish law uh, by rabbinical courts, a very controversial um, practice. Uh, the internet is another example, which is often discussed. Uh, the reality is that certain aspects of the internet are effectively self-governing, independent of national law. The technical regulation of the internet is designed to be independent of national law. But in fact, the content of the internet is increasingly governed by private regulatory standards. The community standards of Facebook, uh, rather than the application of uh, state law to regulate conduct on the internet. And the third example that uh, is very often talked about is arbitration. Whether arbitration is detached from national law is, of course, one of 
the most hotly contested questions. Some arbitrators and scholars have suggested that arbitration is transnational in character, that it routinely can and should apply non-state law. And that in so doing, it does not depend on national law because it's practically self-enforcing in the community of international business. The argument that these examples suggest is that, at least in some contexts, non-state law is a reality, whether national law likes it or not. Now, of course, just being real does not make non-state law good. But it presents a challenge to state law. Is the influence of non-state law a positive development or simply an inescapable reality? Now, I think perhaps lessons could be learned here from the Namibia exception I mentioned before, the principle that sometimes the foreign law of an unrecognized state should nevertheless be recognized simply because it is a fact on the ground. Should non-state law similarly be recognized in some contexts simply because it provides the actual facts or realities under which people live their lives or do business? The laws which regulate the day-to-day -day affairs of the people, to quote from the Hesperides Hotels case, a case dealing with the unrecognized state of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. There's a strong argument, for example, that if two companies enter into a contract with an arbitration agreement and a choice of law clause in favor of the unijoie principles, and sensibly enough, conduct themselves in accordance with those principles, it would be entirely inappropriate to apply national law to govern their contract if a dispute later came before national courts. If we decide that the reality of non-state law should be recognized, then the further question arises as to how that recognition should take place. And it's private international law which is uniquely situated to respond to this problem. And I think it's private international lawyers who are faced with the most challenging <coughs> questions. I would like to make the case for the importance of private international law as central to dealing with these sorts of issues. So should choice of law be opened to non-state law? And if so, under what conditions? Now, obviously, I wouldn't dream of trying to answer these questions today. But if non-state law is to be accepted, then it's obvious that the traditional justifications for the legitimacy of foreign law in private international law, dependent on source legitimacy, I mentioned before, don't work. Non-state law is not the command of sovereign in a world of sovereign and equal states. So why and when should it be recognized? Now, it's striking to me that the Hague principles that I mentioned earlier offer a first engagement with this issue, potentially accepting non-state law, but subjecting it to new conditions of legitimacy. Just to remind you, the principles say that the law chosen by the parties may be rules of law that are generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level as a neutral and balanced set of rules, unless the law of the forum provides otherwise. In this one step, private international law has opened a window into the universe of political philosophy, which is rather like opening a window in a hurricane. Looking more closely, there are two separate criteria here identified, each of which raises a host of further questions. The first criteria is that the law must be generally accepted. Is this an echo of HLA Hart's theory of legitimacy is derived from collective acceptance? It seems to be something like a criteria of process legitimacy, but it's not clear whose acceptance is required, and it's not clear why it's not enough that the parties themselves have accepted the non-state law. The second criteria is that the law must be neutral and balanced. This seems to be a substantive legitimacy criteria perhaps an echo of Rawls's minimum content of justice. But what does it mean in practice? If your legal system treats all parties equally, providing no special rights for weaker parties, does that mean it's balanced or unbalanced? Setting aside these criticisms, and uh, I could raise many other points, the key point that I want to make is that these two tests recognize, uh, represent two recognizable different theories of legitimacy. And of course, public policy remains as an additional uh, factor that might be taken into account. But we also see the absence here of other possible theories of legitimacy. The rules of non-state law do not need to have been generated through representative or participatory processes, for example. And there's at least an argument that these uh, procedural legitimacy questions or aspects would provide stronger support for justifying recognition of a non-state law system 
particularly because they'd be more closely aligned with the way in which non-state law often emerges from practices rather than from institutions. So what are my conclusions from all this? Private international law has traditionally largely avoided the complexities of legitimacy questions by approaching foreign law in a purely formal way, under the influence of the formalism of public international law. Foreign law is legitimate in a traditional private international law sense if it's the law of a recognized sovereign and does not violate minimum standards of substantive justice. But in both public and private international law, this formalism is limited, it's qualified, and as a matter of justice and fairness, the laws of unrecognized sovereigns can sometimes be recognized. Added to this picture now, we have the development of non-state law, which in reality already regulates a range of private legal relations, both within and across states. A choice of law could respond to this development by denying its validity, but at the risk of increasing conflicts of law and even rendering itself irrelevant and indeed potentially unjust where non-state law is an inescapable fact for the parties. Or it could respond to the development by accepting its inevitability, but at the risk of disempowering the state and public regulatory interests. Whatever approach is taken, it's clear that private international law is a crucial battleground for non-state law. I think there's cause for optimism here. Private international law has long been concerned with managing multiple potentially conflicting legal orders, and so it's uniquely positioned with a degree of adaptation to be the gateway, a gateway which might be open or closed to non-state law. But these developments take private international law far away from the safety of the sovereign equality of states into a world where those developing, studying, and even applying private international law rules need to newly engage with questions of the normative evaluation of a foreign legal order. In this brave new world of private international law and its potential openness to law beyond the state, we may all be at great risk of becoming legal philosophers. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much to Richard and the other organizers for including my topic in this morning's uh, presentation. Um, although it's a bit of a Canadian story uh, and therefore boring by definition, according to, uh, <laughs> to many people, I hope it'll have some resonance for, for, uh, for you uh, because we are a sort of private international law system that had theory thrust upon it uh, by the courts which is not the way things usually happen. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do uh, is uh, just provide a little bit of context uh, by looking briefly at the, how the Canadian, the relevant sort of aspects of the Canadian Constitution uh, compare with some of the other uh, constitutions and quasi-constitutional arrangements <clears throat> uh, that have uh, created private international law elsewhere, and then tell you the Canadian story of the last 25 years and then suggest some conclusions uh, and the conclusions actually go on for some time so when you see the word conclusion appear on the screen don't perk up too much uh, because there'll be more. Um, so uh, first of all this general question of how do how does private international law fit with constitutional arrangements really is part of the, the larger question of where you locate private international law in the hierarchy of norms uh, within uh, the state or within other entities. And uh, so is do the rules of private international law have some status that uh, distinguishes them from other rules of civil law? And um, the practical questions uh, that attach to this are who can change the rules uh, and subject to what constraints. And then the, in federal states such as Canada, uh, you get the additional uh, question, um, uh, is there a distinction, and sometimes the Constitution requires you to make a distinction, between interstate or interprovincial in Canada cases as distinct from international cases. So. Uh, 
if you look at, you start with codified systems. Codified systems actually have the best uh, sort of uh, machinery, if you like, for dealing with private international law because they, uh, the, the very notion of a code lends itself to um, putting private international law in a sort of separate uh, part of the code or in uh, as a comprehensive book within the code, such as Quebec did in the 1990s, or as a separate little code or big code, uh, as in Germany or in Switzerland. And so if you do that, uh, then uh, it is clear that the rules of private international law are, are play a role distinct from other rules of, uh, of civil uh, law, but they are still under the ultimately uh, under the control of the legislature. Uh, the European Union, of course, is an example of a supranational uh, body growing uh, constantly of private international law. Um, now very largely uh, covered by these regulations. Uh, these are just the, the major ones. All of you know them better than I do. Uh, and there's now the succession regulation you could add to this list. And so uh, these are, this is not a constitutional status awarded to these rules. But nevertheless, it, because changing the rules uh, has to, depends upon the uh, the machinery of the, the legislative machinery uh, of Europe as a whole, uh, the national legislatures are largely uh, unable to, uh, to change these rules. It requires a, a, the, the supranational uh, consensus or machinery to operate. Um, if you look at Canada and three other common law countries, I'll start with England uh, because we inherited now, Quebec, of course, has a separate system of private international law. It is subject, as every province's law is, to the ultimate decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada. But um, the, uh, the tradition of Quebec private international law is much closer to, uh, to French law. Uh, but the rest of the jurisdictions of Canada, the nine provinces and the territories up north, uh, derive their private international law from England, and so the, the characteristics of the English uh, system as it existed before the European uh, changes uh, really were drawn uh, into the Canadian system. Uh, then you have the United States, uh, which uh, has a constitution that says a few things about private international law from which the courts have extrapolated. You have Australia, which actually is the constitution of these countries that has the most uh, in it, that where the drafters actually did think about private international law. And then in Canada, our constitution says absolutely nothing expressly about private international law, but the courts have found principles uh, lurking within it uh, that uh, that have been extremely important. So just going back and looking at the English tradition, um, uh, this goes back to the comment about uh, there is no theory uh, in, in English private international law. There, 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 the theory or the such theory as there was is that they were simply the rules of domestic law that applied to interjurisdictional cases. Uh, jurisdiction was seen really as a largely procedural matter um, and uh, the enforcement of judgments was handled by assimilating judgments to debts, and so you could kind of uh, domesticate them that way. Um, and choice of law was really a, a, a sort of thing that the judges had to deal with. Um, and the, although it's a multi-jurisdictional country, of course, the UK is not a federal state, and so the judges tended to treat intra-United Kingdom conflicts on the same basis as international ones. Uh, and uh, in the case law in the last couple of centuries, international cases have tended to uh, give the, the uh, create the, the, the sort of the emphasis uh, in uh, English private international law. And I mention all of this because Canada inherited a good deal of this. Um, again, we inherited outside Quebec which codified its uh, 
its grounds of jurisdiction, but we inherited the idea that really you treat jurisdiction largely as a matter of the rules of court. Um, we uh, treated foreign judgments from within Canada the same as judgments from outside Canada. Uh, I should say that the balance of interprovincial and international cases in Canada is a complicated, it's not, it's not very heavily one way or the other because a good deal of the private uh, cross-border action in Canada is uh, with the United States uh, or with, in some cases, Europe uh, or Asia more than, uh, than it is in some areas at least with other provinces of Canada. So the, there's both interprovincial and international cases in, in significant numbers involved. <coughs> Um, and the choice of law has, again, not been the subject of a lot of legislation. Uh, and I've, as I've mentioned, Quebec is really quite, has a quite a different tradition. Um, the U.S. Uh, Constitution, um, the two provisions, or three, uh, that are relevant, one is the full faith and credit obligation, which relates to each state's obligation to... Uh, to give full faith and credit to the public acts and so on of every other state, and from that, a body of rules about mandatory recognition of the judgments of other states uh, has evolved. And you have uh, the due process uh, provisions in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, um, which, and I note this, uh, it attaches to deprivation of life, liberty, or property and that's one big difference with the uh, Canadian Constitution, that property is not protected uh, under the Canadian Constitution, whereas it is under the U.S. Constitution. Um, from this, the American courts have developed the minimum contacts uh, theory of jurisdiction. Uh, that, that, is the, that is a basic constitutional requirement. Um, and that the recognition of sister state judgments is mandatory, provided this uh, minimum contacts uh, requirement is met. And choice of law has also been um, seen as linked to the Constitution, uh, that a, a, a state, in order to impose a certain choice of law rule, um, must have significant, uh, or, or to impose its own law, must have significant contacts with the uh, with the issue being uh, being dealt with, and that too is linked to both full faith and credit, which is the uh, to the, the network of mutual recognition among the states, and to due process, which is the sort of substantive justice requirement, and they are on the whole mixed in the in the decisions of the courts. Um, Australia. Uh, I, I won't go through these individually, but there are a number of provisions in the Australian Constitution giving the federal, the Commonwealth Parliament, the power to legislate, and it has exercised that power on everything but choice of law. Uh, but there is, in effect, a, a uniform uh, private international law in interstate cases um, in jurisdiction and foreign judgments. Um, and uh, choice of law, although not within any specific federal power, uh, the High Court of Australia has been attracted from time to time to the idea that implicitly the Constitution also uh, requires a uniformity of choice of law among the states. But that, they, they've, that idea has come and, and, and gone. Um, and and it's, it's not a sort of fixed point. So uh, turning to Canada, there, we don't have a full faith and credit clause. So there is nothing saying what uh, each cup province is required to recognize with respect to the laws of other provinces. There is no due process provision because uh, it, there is one, but it applies only to uh, life, liberty, and security of the person. Uh, not to property, and so as a matter of civil justice, you don't, uh, you can't invoke that particular provision of the Charter of Rights. Um, the one constitutional doctrine that sort of touches on private international law is a very unsatisfactory line of cases um, which focus on the 
incapacity of provinces, and provinces basically are the ones who legislate on private law. So private international law is very much concerned with the laws of the provinces. Um, but the provinces' uh, power to legislate is restricted to property and civil rights in the province and the administration of justice in the province. So what the Canadian uh, Constitution did, and I'll skip that slide, um, it, it, what the court discovered in the Morgard case in 1990 is that really there was an implicit um, uh, constitutional underpinning to uh, Canadian private international law. The actual issue in the case was simply whether a, an undefended judgment from one province, Alberta, could be enforced against a uh, resident of British Columbia who had taken no part in the litigation. The traditional English inherited recognition rules would say no because there was neither submission nor presence within the jurisdiction when the action was commenced. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada said this is out of date. The private international law must facilitate the, the, the phrase that sort of echoes through the cases, facilitate the flow of wealth, uh, wealth skills and people across state lines in a fair and orderly manner. And they bolstered that by saying, we think the Constitution implicitly requires provinces to give full faith and credit to each other's laws, from which they developed a theory that jurisdiction was only valid if it uh, was based upon a real and substantial connection with the province. And um, from that flowed the full faith and credit obligation to recognize the judgment. Now, and it was the, well, the original case didn't make clear whether these were really uh, constitutionally mandatory principles, but the Hunt case later on made it clear that they were. So jurisdiction requires this real and substantial connection as to be constitutionally valid. Now the responses to this have been, the court started saying, well, jurisdiction therefore is a question of real and substantial connection. In every case you have to determine whether this connection exists. Um, there have been responses to that, a uniform act on jurisdiction uh, to reduce the uncertainty attaching to this uh, test. And more recently in the Van Breda case in 2012, the Supreme Court itself uh, retreated from the sort of real and substantial connection as the conflicts rule and said, well, no, the actual rules of jurisdiction should be based on presumptive connecting factors, judicially developed connecting factors. Um, and uh, you can't just ask globally whether there's a real and substantial connection. And so there's been an attempt to sort of come back and address the uh, indeterminacy problem. Um, the effect of this constitutional con constitutionalization of jurisdiction for judgments has been that, and again, I'm going to have to skip the detail on that slide, um, the, uh, the test applied to foreign judgments uh, there was every reason for the court to draw a distinction between enforcement of Canadian judgments and enforcement of foreign judgments. It hasn't done so. And it uh, extended this idea that you should recognize an undefended judgment based upon a real and substantial connection, uh, extended that to fully foreign judgments in, in this Beals and Saldana case. Um, and the uh, another implication of the constitutionalization has been that uh, courts are obliged to enforce not just uh, monetary judgments but non-monetary orders as well since that is part of the full faith and credit uh, obligation under which the, the, the Constitution places them. So um, let me now get to the, my lengthy conclusion which I'm going to have one minute to explain. Um, why, did the, why did the court get into this? And the, uh, I, my, I suggest that they did it for a number of reasons. One was they wanted to revitalize private international law, which they did. 
um, by bolstering this, this idea of comity, particularly among the provinces, but it's, it's embraced really the world as well, uh, to set up some kind of national standards and to uh, bring, take on board the existing constitutional doctrines on extraterritoriality. Uh, the, whether this has actually been achieved, you could ask, did they have to go through all this? In, did they have to go to the Constitution to do this? And the answer, I think, is no. They could have achieved most of it, at least, with, by non-constitutional means. But they chose to do it via the Constitution. Is that a good thing? Well, um, I do think it's been good in the sense that it's forced Canadian private international law to be completely rethought. Um, and our law of jurisdiction is now a little bit better than it was before Morgard. Um, the, I think the foreign judgments, I think we've gone a little overboard on recognizing undefended judgments from outside Canada. I think there's too few uh, defenses to these for Canadian defendants. And choice of law has really not been much affected as yet. Um, but the other flip side of this is the improvements in the system are as much the rea because of the reaction to the constitutionalizing as due to the constitutionalizing itself. Um, so it's not that the constitutional principles have been that helpful, but what they have put in train, the, the, what, the, the, what they have forced us to do, has actually been quite constructive. Um, and of course, it, the other effect of the constitutionalization is that there are certain things which no provincial legislature can now alter. And I, my final point uh, is that one of the reasons why it's a kind of mixed picture, if you ask, well, is this a, a good thing that happened to us, is that our constitution really wasn't terribly, didn't give us very good instruments to work with. Um, there was no due, due process kind of provision. It all had to be built on the extraterritoriality principle and on a sort of general notion of comity. Um, and those uh, w didn't have enough content to them, really, to shape private international law um, in and of themselves. But the dynamic that they put in, uh, put in motion has, I think, been on the whole a good thing for Canadian private international law. Thank you.